Turn to 1 John chapter 5 today. 1 John chapter 5, and uh, we're going to um, we're going to look at the Word of God today in regards to a, a message. In short, this will not be a long message, but a message in regards to salvation. And specifically, how we can know that we have been saved. Every one of us need to have that assurance and be able to fall back on that assurance of what the Word of God says in regards to that. So from 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, uh, we find the following passage of Scripture. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. Can you say amen? amen? And this life is in his son, Jesus. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Can you say amen? amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. All right. You know, probably all of you here have been like me and you have been around people uh, from time to time uh, that you may either know well or you may have only met them on a, on a new basis. And if you make some kind of a statement or you say specifically in the conversation, I'm glad I'm saved, they will reply to you and say, well, you know, no one can really know for sure if they're saved. Has anyone ever responded to you like that? I know I've had countless numbers of people say that to me. They're, they're always struggling with doubt. And I have a reply that I use, that I fall back on in this kind of situation, and I say the Bible says I can and I am sure that I am saved. I can know and I am sure that I am saved. In fact, I am as sure for heaven as if I were already standing there now. That ought to be the testimony of every person in this room. Can you say amen? Just as sure as it can be, no. There is no question. There is no doubt. I know. I know that God has saved me and I am heaven bound. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christians can know. Christians are meant to know that they are saved. Every one of us who profess to be believers need to be a kind of individual that knows that heaven is our home. In this life, we're just passing through. We're pilgrims, we're strangers, and we're on our way. We're on a life's journey, but that life's journey here on earth will end with our being in the presence of the Lord in heaven forever. Do you look forward to that? No one? <laughs> I look forward to it. Every day that goes by, I look forward to heaven a little bit more and a little bit more. That doesn't mean that we're supposed to discredit our life now. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to enjoy the life that we have or we're supposed to be consumed with a future vision that leaves nothing for the present moment. But it simply means that we know in our heart that at the end of the day, the day of this life, we're going to be transported by our spirit or in body and spirit, depending on whether we're raptured and caught up together with those that have gone before us or whether we go by the grave. Either way, we're going to instantly be in the presence 
of the Lord. I look forward to seeing Jesus. I look forward to spending eternity in heaven with the Lord. And what I want you to understand today and what the Word of God is trying to say to us is that we do not have to settle for a hope so salvation. A hope that I am. No. You are meant to know. God wants you to know. It's not a maybe so type of Christianity or profession, but it's a, I know I'm ready to meet the Lord. Amen? You can have assurance. You're meant to have assurance. This is not some kind of a eternal guessing game. You are meant to have assurance in your heart and in your life. John wrote these words so that we could know for sure that we are saved. That we might have the, the, the uh, assurance in our hearts and our life that there's going to be a triumph coming in our life. And that triumph is going to be marked by being in the presence of Jesus. We can know. Now, let me say as well right now, though, that I understand sometimes we all struggle with some doubts. We're human. I think all of us here are human. If I went around here and pinched each one of you, I think you'd, you'd say, ow! That tells me you're human. <laughs> If we're human, we can experience some doubts in our life. All Christians have times when we struggle with doubt. But I want you to hear me. Doubt is never meant to be defeating and devastating in your Christian walk. There ought to be that ability being strengthened by the presence of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling in your life that will walk you through that time of doubt and raise you up and you come above that doubt and still have that know that you know from the Lord. I'm thankful today we can do that. How about you? I'm thankful today that we don't have to live in that, well, I hope so type of mentality. That would be a pretty difficult thing every day to deal with. John pins some truths that can take away our doubts. John, in these truths, replaced them with an assurance against doubt. And that's what we need to know and look at today. When you lack assurance, you lack confidence in yourself and more importantly, you lack confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior. And none of us want that. Assurance is important because every one of us here have an eternal soul. Every one of us. It will spend eternity in one of two places. That soul will spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. So which one we spend it in depends on you and the Lord Jesus Christ. In light of that, we need to be absolutely sure today where we will spend eternity. Amen? We need to be sure. Allow me to show you today how to be saved and how to be sure of that salvation. First of two points. Normally you get three. Today I'm giving you two. So hang on. The acquisition of salvation. How does a person get saved? How? 1 John 5, 1 says salvation is, an, is accomplished through simple belief in the person of Jesus Christ. Now when I say belief, I'm talking about a belief that says, I truly believe Jesus is the way. I believe in the Lord. 
I believe that in fact the promise promises he has made are true. I believe in fact that he is the promised Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that he is the only true way to heaven. And I receive him as my Savior. I receive him as my Lord. I receive him as my soon coming King. I believe Jesus is the one. Amen? Amen. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But belief is not just some kind of a mental assent to the facts. Just something that says, well, okay, I'll switch this switch in my mindset and I'll get over to that part. It's based on faith. Faith. You have to base it on your faith in the actions and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. In the natural, in a worldly sense, in a human sense, we have a hard time grasping what Jesus did for us on Calvary. It's bigger than we are. So that's where we come into a position and a situation where we allow the Lord to help our faith to grow that helps us to say, I know that I know, I believe in Jesus. I believe in his commitment to me. And therefore in faith I have committed myself unto him. Salvation comes not on the basis of your actions but on the basis of your faith. Your faith, your belief in the Lord it cannot depend on the best 15 minutes of your life either. You know, I did some really good things at 10 a.m. three years ago on August the 1st. So I'm sure it heaven back. <laughs> Everyone here has done some good things. Everyone here has blessed the Lord in some way with their life. But it can't depend on just that kind of a situation. It has to depend upon a faith. I'm not saved because of anything I have done. You are not saved because of anything that you have done. But you are saved because of a faith and a pure grace that resides in your life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Picture grace like this. David, come here. I told you I was going to have you help me preach this morning. Come on. You thought I was kidding, didn't you? <laughs> Stand right over here. There you go. All right. Okay. Grace. Picture. Picture grace as God reaching down and saying, I love you and I want to save you. You see, I'm God. And I'm reaching down towards you because I want to save you. Now, you have a responsibility in this day, but just like all of these here do. And that responsibility is as I reach down to you, you have to reach up. Come on. Take my hand. There you go. See? We in faith take hold of the hand of God and God saves us. Amen. It's a beautiful thing. Everybody's seen that that very famous painting that Michelangelo did in the Sistine Chapel on the ceiling. It's the hand of God, you know, the finger of God reaching out. Amen? We need to reach back. Okay, you're done. <laughs> now I can be happy again. <laughs> Good job, David. <laughs> we have a 
responsibility. We have to reach up to the Lord. And we have to say, I want to be saved. I believe today what you have said in your word and in my spirit. Salvation comes to those who will place their unreserved faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll reach out and they'll take hold of that precious, wonderful hand and believe. Believe in faith. They have trusted Jesus. They've trusted Jesus alone for their salvation and their eternal life. The second point that I will make today is this, and it is in regards to the assurance of salvation. The book of 1 John was written to give Christians assurance of salvation. John uses the word no almost 40 times in this very short little book in the word. No. No. He wants, God wants you to know. Yoni, he wants you to know you're saved. He doesn't want you stumbling around out in the darkness saying, well, I hope so. He wants you to know. To know. To believe. To know it's true. He does this because the Lord wants us always to have that assurance. That know that I know that I know that I have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I am saved and made ready for heaven. In the course of this little small book, he gives us three basic tests that I think we can use to determine whether or not we have been born again, whether we have received salvation. The first we'll call the Lordship test. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? This is a part that oftentimes is kind of skimmed over in a lot of people's walk with the Lord. They don't have a problem saying, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus saved me. They may not even have a problem with some kind of a statement of, I believe Jesus is coming again. He's coming for me. But when we talk about this thing of lordship. Mm, we struggle with that. Because lordship means we have someone to answer to. Someone who we are responsible to. Someone who we live our life for. Is Jesus the Lord of your life today? Is he in control of you? Pastor Diane was talking about that this morning before service. This people don't want to think that they have been determined to be controlled by someone. We want to be free. We want to do our thing. So when we come to this thing about as a believer, I place my life in the hands of God and I give Him control in my life. That's really difficult for some people to say, Amen! They struggle. They want the gift of salvation. They want eternal life. But, you know, in the meantime, I want to do my own thing. Is he Lord of your life? You see, in the heart of a Christian, there will be a desire to do the will of God. Let me repeat that. 
do the will of God. I want to do the will of God. That is the desire of my heart. I don't want to just be a receiver of His love, His mercy, and His salvation and eternal life, but I want to do His will in my life every moment of the day. I want Him to be in control. A desire. You see, a person who could care less about what God thinks is a person I can tell you, I question seriously their salvation. You can't say I'm saved and then say, well, you know, but I, I, I'm not a person I do anything. When we're saved, we're in the hands of God. That's where we're meant to be. That's where God wants us to be. That's where we need to be. A truly born again person will have as his heart's desire a desire to be in obedience to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Be in obedience to the Lord. There's that thing about letting them be in control. You know, it used to be that sailors steered their way through the night. They kept their course by knowing the stars. They watched the stars. They knew the sun and they knew their direction because of the stars that they plotted their course upon. It was something that was often referred to as sailors keeping the stars. They kept their course through their vision of the stars. Sometimes though, if they were, were not careful, it was not difficult for them to get distracted. Now, I was thinking about this this week and I thought, wow, stars. You know, you take a, a clear night and there's unbelievable amount of stars up there. And you have to study pretty good to know the specifics of those stars to a certain degree if you're going to plan your course according to those stars. But you might be in the process of trying to figure out that course through those stars and Someone comes alongside you and begins to talk to you about something and you get distracted. The boat keeps on moving. <laughs> but you're not plotting your course because you're talking to somebody else. You get distracted and pretty soon when you realize it, you find yourself off course. That's one of the enemy's favorite tactics for each and every one of us. You can know Jesus. You can be doing your best to follow Jesus, his plan for your life, but the enemy of your soul is going to be speaking into your heart and mind and trying to distract you and get you off course. Turned away from where you need to be. You see, we have to be careful. It's not a matter of living a completely sinless life. That would be wonderful. But there's no one here in this room that can do that. We can't do that. I wish we could. There is no sinless perfection that comes into play here. But instead we have a life and a heart that is striving to live for Jesus. Plotting our course in regards to His Holy Spirit's guidance so that we can live our life to the best of our ability and through His leading for His glory and for His purpose. 
Sinners are not saved by keeping his commandments. Remember that. But saints are marked by a desire to do what pleases God. We need that course to fall from the Lord. The next test I'll call the fellowship test. 1 John 3.14 talks about this. There will be a genuine love for God and for His children. Sometimes we struggle with both issues there. Sometimes when we feel like God is sliding us somehow or He's not hearing us or He's not answering our prayers the way that we would like for Him to, then we have this thing that, that struggles within us and our love for Him, our genuine love for Him, becomes somewhat questionable. That's always a difficult situation. And more often than that, though, we have to understand that we struggle with our genuine love for the children of God, for fellow believers, professed believers. Sometimes, you know, there are people that kind of do it the way we think we're, they're supposed to, and oh, it's pretty not too hard to love them. But when they're not walking in accordance with that, then sometimes we struggle with that love situation. But you see, in the heart of a believer, there will always or should always be a true desire for unity, a desire for peace, a desire for fellowship amongst each other. It doesn't mean it's always perfect. It doesn't mean we don't have to work at it, but there's always the desire there that helps us to do so. You see, love is meant to characterize a true Christian believer. And there will be times of struggle, times of struggle between believers, but true Christians cannot allow those feelings to linger and cause strife and harm, disunity and disfellowship with each other. It's very important. The third test we'll call the relationship test. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 deals with this. Salvation is a vital relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. A vital, ongoing relationship with the Lord. The Bible never tells us to point back to some previous experience to determine the status of our soul. It says to look Look to our current relationship with the Lord. You've heard me say many, many, many times, it's not a matter of simply praying a sinner's prayer and that's it, you're done. Hallelujah. It's a matter of keeping the relationship with the Lord alive and real that keeps us where we need to be. Is Christ your companion today? Is he your ever constant companion? Is he your friend? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior today truly? Or is he just someone you've heard about, but you've never really ever bothered to get to know him? The question is not, did you believe? Did you believe in Jesus? But rather it is, are you believing in Him now? In this moment, in this circumstance, in this situation in your life, do you have a relationship with the Lord right now that is alive and well in your life? You know, it's not like a light switch. Turn it on, turn it off. Turn it on, turn it on. The Lord is meant to be an ongoing, all the time, relationship in our life. If He is present in your life, He will make His presence known in you. So let me conclude with this. It may be that you have never been able to grasp the assurance that God 
has said was yours for the half. Remember that. God has said is yours. The assurance is yours. But I was thinking about this this week. I was thinking about the fact that when I was very young in my faith, my my faith in the Lord was kind of like a, a roller coaster. <laughs> This kind of thing. Up and down. Up and down. Maybe you can relate to what I'm saying. I was certain one moment I was saved. And the next moment I was doubting. Because I was down at the bottom. And it went that way until one day I was asking God to do something that maybe some of you have done yourself in your own spiritual walk. And you're in the position where once again you're asking God for the umpteenth time, Lord, please save me. Save me. And I remember when that situation was taking place one time in my life and the Holy Spirit stopped me and the Holy Spirit said, I've already saved you. I've already cleansed you. I've already put my gift of salvation upon you. I've already written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I did it the first time you asked me. Who are you doubting? Are you doubting me? Or are you doubting you? God keeps His promises. Amen? And he's promised to save you. And you've asked him to come to him for that salvation. Then the salvation is yours. Now, can you throw it away? Yeah. But not easily. Not because you made a mistake here, you made a mistake there, that kind of thing. No. saved. His hand is upon you. His love is in your heart. Yeah, sometimes you may have a little doubt or you may struggle, but bottom line, at the end of the day, you can come back to the realization that Jesus is my Savior. He's my Lord. He's that Lord thing again. And He's my Savior and King. We can't doubt God. And if we can't doubt God and His promises that we have saved us, then what are we messing around doubting ourselves about? We're not the salvation here. You see, you come to the point where you realize God is as good as His Word. His Word is either true and cannot be changed, or it's not. We come to the place where we can say, I am saved today, and I know it, because God said I am. Amen? God said I am. You see, that's the kind of assurance that's available to each and every one of us today. All we have to do is come to Him. All we have to do is receive it. All we have to do is take hold of that precious hand as David did a while ago. Only this time it's God's hand. And we take hold of it. And our life changes. We realize we're in the hands of Almighty God. And salvation is ours. Amen. 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 God 
want you to have assurance today. He wants you to know that you're saved. He doesn't want you walking in fear and doubt. He wants you to be blessed by His everlasting presence in your heart and mind. And that, when that is there, there's something about that that just touches others around you. Because they don't have that assurance. And they sense something different in you. And they realize there's something there that they want. Something they desire. And we know, we know that something is Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today, ask the Lord to give you an opportunity to say to someone, I'm saved and I know it. How about you? <laughs> Praise God. Let's share the love of Jesus with those around you. God bless you today. The Spirit has visited you. You are dismissed. Praise the Lord.